We talk a lot around here about East Coast boats like Pearson or Hinkley and the world famous Island Packet. Even the most prestigious West Coast builders like Catalina eventually moved to the East Coast and now they're all made in Florida. So why is that? Why do sailboats seem to keep going to the East Coast? This week on Everything You Need to Know, we're talking about which coast is better for sailing and why brands keep moving east, like today's subject, San Juan. Our story today starts in 1960, the start of a decade that saw the beginning of the Vietnam War, the race to put a man on the moon, and the greatest generation of cars ever made, and a man called Bob Clark, who wanted to build sailboats, Bob was from Ohio, and there's nothing wrong with that. He had a degree in teaching, education, and a love for woodworking, but he found himself as a laborer making car parts. But he was creative, and he designed a few prototype car parts for his employer uh, while he built sailing dinghies at home in his garage. But Bob was tired of the day-to-day -day grind, so Bob did what you do if you live in Ohio in the 1960s and you want some more adventure in your life. He moved to Washington, the state. Bob started up the Clark Boat Company because his name's Bob Clark, but not with the intention of designing his own boats, pen to paper, or dreaming up new innovative ideas for the sailing world. The industry back then was really divided. You had naval architects and designers that would draw and design the boats, but they would never build them. Then on the other hand, you had the boat builders, the guys that would buy the designs and do the actual construction of the boat. In 1960, most of those builders were specializing in wooden sailboats. You could build them out of anything. The designer didn't care. So the builders would make them out of wood. But a few of them in that era were starting to break through into fiberglass. Now, Bob wanted to simply build boats. And to be successful in that game, you really had to be picky about which design you picked to build. If you bought the rights to something that no one wanted, then no one would buy it after you built it. And your company would go broke faster than Johnny Depp. Just kidding, I'm on Team Sparrow all the way. The safe bet at the time was to buy into a design that was already hot on the market and easy to sell. So Bob did what you do in the 1960s sailboat world. You get a hold of Olin Stevens. You may have heard of him from Sparkman and Stevens. Bob bought into building the Lightning, which was designed in 1938 and is still one of the most successful racing class sailing dinghies in the United States to this day. There have been over 16,000 Lightnings built and they're still in production right now. The Lightning may look like a modern race boat because it uses a fractional sloop rig, which means the forestay doesn't go all the way to the top of the mast, which makes for the mast needing to be moved forward a little bit, giving you a smaller head sail, but a larger main, making the boat easier to control and better at sailing upwind. After Bob built a bunch of lightnings and found success, he branched out into other designs and started building the OK, which is a racing dinghy that was later used in the Olympics. The world championship winning 505 racing dinghy was next. He built a bunch of those. And then the Thistle, which is a boat that was used as the primary yardstick for the Portsmouth numbers. That's a big deal. Not to be trapped in the dinghy game, Bob also built a keel boat. It was called the Star. Again, not designed by him, he was just building it. But if you've never heard of the Star, this thing is amazing. It was the Olympic keelboat from 1932 all the way till 2012. 80 years of Olympic sailing. And when you see them in action, you can see why. It's not a bad boat considering it was designed in 1910, 102 years earlier than when it finished its work in the Olympics. Bob didn't keep all the success to himself at the Clark Boat Company either. He hired almost his whole family. His son, Dennis, was hired on, and Dennis started his own sail loft in 1971, and it was also a one design champion in several racing series. Another son, Dave Clark, became the head of sales and marketing for the Clark Boat Company, while son Don Clark, a third one, they all start with D, I don't know what's up. Don went off to earn a degree in engineering and studied naval architecture. So when Don came back, he started designing boats, and Don was the one that actually designed the San Juan 21. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make this whole channel possible. Uh, big thank you to this week's newest patrons. We have Paul, JR, or Junior, not sure, and Steven. Thank you guys so much for joining the team. 
The San Juan 21 was one of the first major market successes of the Clark Boat Company with a boat that they had designed in-house, which was sort of weird at the time. It debuted at the Seattle Boat Show in 1970 and everyone loved it. They built over 2,600 of them. The San Juan 21 is basically a little race boat with a flat coach roof design to cut windage, sleeping accommodations for four people on a 21-footer because it had two quarter berths. It even had a head. The 21 is still actively raced all over North America, and with the board up, it can be trailered, so you can tow it to where the racing is happening. The San Juan 21, however, was indicative of a trend in the 1970s that makes it kind of hard to identify one, and honestly, I'm surprised no one got in trouble. And let me explain. I'm going to show you three pictures of three different boats. Let's see if you can figure out which one the San Juan 21 is. We have this one with a flat roof and a blue stripe. This one with a flat roof and a blue stripe. And this one with a flat roof and a brown stripe. You see what I mean? They all seem to come from the same mold. In fact, this one is a Cal 25, which was made in California. This one is my dad's boat, a Clipper 26. And this handsome guy here is the San Juan 21. After the San Juan 21, however, the Clarks did what everyone seemed to be doing at the time. The sailboat market had always been a bit more lucrative on the East Coast than it was out West at the time, so they opened a facility in North Carolina, which is beautiful by the way, the state, not the facility they opened. And not to be outdone by other East Coast boat builders, they needed another big name in their designs. There's one name in the sailboat racing world that is spoken in hushed tones, with great respect and admiration, and when his name is on a design, it's sure to be successful three-time sailing Olympian, yacht designer, and truly sailing royalty, Bruce Kirby. Bruce was high on life from his design earlier of the laser, which you've probably heard of, becoming a world-famous success, and the Clarks hired him to do some designs for them. And what they got back was the San Juan 24. They made over a thousand of those. And then the San Juan 30, which was designed to compete in the IOR class halftime boats. In 1977, the Clarks deviated from their focus on racy little go-fast sailboats and took a stab at another emerging market. They went after the weekender family sailor, who prefer the easy-to-set-up trailer sailor that you can leave in your driveway. So they took a shot straight at the McGregor 26 by building the San Juan 26 with a centerboard. Ultimately, McGregor won that fight because, face it, trailer sailors are... McGregor's party piece. It's what they do, so it's really hard to beat them at that game. The Clarks killed off their little trailer sailor, and they went back to focus on racing, and they built the San Juan 7.7. That's meters. The most successful boats that came out of the Clarks boat manufacturing world and the San Juan name were the San Juan 28 and the 29, but as with most sailboat companies in the 80s, they didn't survive, and they sold the company in 1984, and it went bankrupt. Tanzer actually bought a few of the molds, and they made a few more San Juans, but that was kind of short-lived. This brings me to my point. While San Juan and Clark boats are certainly names to be taken seriously if you're boat shopping and you're looking for a little trailer sailor or a 20-something foot racy sort of boat with a great support system and class racing all over the place, any San Juan you get is going to have that. They're an example of boats moving from the West Coast to the East Coast as well, though. So why is that? The West Coast has a lot to offer, starting up in the Pacific Northwest, from the coast and the islands in British Columbia, Canada, down to the San Juans. The problem is that there just isn't much south of Oregon, until you get to California. But you do have the option of heading down to Panama, Costa Rica, that kind of thing, even across to Hawaii, which is definitely on my bucket list as the most iconic sort of small crossing you can make, Cali to Hawaii. The West Coast also has the entire coast of California, and you could spend a lifetime sailing. It's beautiful, just exploring the coast and everything that it has to offer. And Many folks make the passage from Northern to Southern California and back every year. The West Coast, however, has much longer passages with fewer places of refuge if you get into trouble or you just want to head inland. They also have fewer amenities for the cruising folks who like to take it slow and stay on the cheap side fewer cheap marinas and anchorages, and less infrastructure like the ICW, which sort of brings us to the East Coast. Sailing grounds on the east side of the map go from Greenland all the way to Texas, or if you go the other way, 
to the bottom of the Caribbean under the hurricane belt, with options to head inland just about whenever you want. You'd rarely ever make more than a 60-70 mile day without some sort of place that you can get inland and hide. And if you really want to be what some might call a lazy sailor, I wouldn't, but you could just live in Florida and hop across the Bahamas whenever you want. It really is that easy on the East Coast. The East Coast also has the Chesapeake Bay, which has Annapolis, which is arguably the sailing mecca of North America. If you haven't been to Annapolis's fall sailboat show, I like the spring one too, but the fall one is where it's at. You really have to go. It's super cheap, stay in a motel nearby, it's easy to attend, and it's the biggest gathering of actual, real, true-blooded cruisers I've ever seen. I had Lady K there a few years ago in the Anchorage, and I met hundreds and hundreds of other cruisers, some of which I continued on cruising with, side-by-side side as buddy boats, all the way through the Bahamas. The East Coast is also cheaper in many places because of the sheer options of marinas and anchorages, and you can do the whole thing without many ocean passages at all, if you want to. Except for Georgia. They don't like sailboats there. You also have the Erie Canal to take you to the Great Lakes if you want to go. For some more adventurous, you have the whole Great Loop that you can take off on and earn your East Coast Merit Badge. So which do you prefer? West Coast, Cali to Alaska, Alaska to Cali, or East Coast cruising for the ease of use of it all? Let's have an argument in the comments. That's it for this week, guys. If you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up, and I will see you all next week. Thank you.